Maybe. Good morning, everybody. Good morning, everybody. Ah, oh, good. Let's wake up. Now, uh, stand with me. Um, we're going to get in. This. I'm going to introduce kind of what we're doing. Um, this has become such a wonderful, fun thing that I, I enjoy doing as we step into this adult class. Um, I just want to let you guys know, if you ever need rain, if you look outside and say, you know what, it's so dry, we need some rain. If you will call me up, I will go immediately, wash my car, and it will rain. Every time I wash my car, heaven rains down on us. So it, it's good to have Brother and Sister Harper with us, of course, and uh, this church loves them, loves their ministry, and... Um, Every time that they come, God does incredible things. It's not because that he brings revival in a suitcase. Do we even use suitcases anymore? Yeah, we do. Briefcases. But it, it, there's, you'll, you'll find, and maybe you've found this before, that there are ministries that, that come that just connect. Connect so well um, with a church family. And, and of course, that's why they keep on coming back. Um, he'll just call me, says it's time for me to come back. No, he doesn't. But I, I love them and always appreciate the time that we're going to have. We're going to have some ministry talk again. But before we do that, let's, let's open up this, this with prayer, asking the Lord to have his way for the next 30 or 35 minutes. Father, we love you. We praise you. We're magnifying your holy name. There's none like you. There's nobody as great as you, nobody as wonderful as you, nobody as gracious as you, of course. And so, God, we're asking that you would have your way in this specific place. That, God, you see all of our lives, you see all of our needs, you see all of the things that are going on in our life. And I'm asking, God, that you would show yourself to be strong in this house, that your will would be accomplished. Anoint everything that takes place, for this is not just about presentation. It's not just a show or a movie or entertainment, but we've come to magnify the holiness of you, that you would receive all the praise in the name of Jesus Christ. And they all said, Amen. you may be seated. Brother Hart, if you'll come and um, I believe that that is on. I believe that that water is, is for you. So, so we've done this a couple times with um, um, Pastor Bingham was, was last. And I'm hoping that all, all of our other classes, that when they're, when they're finished, when they go home, that they will um, be able to, to watch us as, as well. This is what I found, is that one of the things in ministry growing up that you see people, uh, ministries that we admire, um, that have spoken into our lives, and uh, sometimes we just don't get, I know that you felt this before, wish we would have had more time to have the conversations outside of the pulpit, outside of the church setting, um, because relationships are built with knowing not just what is being said, but kind of where is this coming from? Why do we have some of the convictions maybe that we, that we have? And so um, we're going to talk about a couple of things. I have about 52 questions that I want to ask him. We're probably not going to get to all 52. But um, hopefully that some of these things is going to help not just the knowledge of him and his wife and their ministry, but um, kind of some helps that we can take on. Because we're supposed to always be learning, right? Always be teachable. How can I make Christianity better. So let's start with number one. You look good. Glad that you guys are here. Um, give us just about um, a minute's worth of kind of your ministry, um, what you're involved in right now, um, and maybe a little background of um, how long you guys have been married and what ministry looked like then. Well, first of all, it's an honor to be with you this morning. Uh, we so much love being here, but uh, I felt the Lord uh, was dealing with me years ago in uh, the summer, or actually the, the fall of 99, and uh, 
had met my beautiful wife beforehand. Uh, we were married. I was obviously not in church. My wife was a backslider, uh, but God saw fit to bring us together. I reached all the way to California where I was playing basketball. I remember her walking by, and I told a friend of mine, I said, I'm going to marry that girl one day. Uh, didn't, hold, didn't even have a clue who she was, but God knew. Um, uh, make a long story short, he, uh, we ended up getting married, and uh, she began to explain to me the revelation of the oneness of God. Yeah. And uh, it's either this way or there's no way around it. And I got the revelation of Jesus' name, Philip, the Holy Ghost, in 99. And uh, the journey has been great. Uh, I would not trade it for nothing. Um, I look back on the miracles and the blessings. The Lord told me to tell you, if you've ever questioned your calling, that it was answered tonight. So from that point on, I knew that God had a work for me. Um, it was just getting myself humble enough to be sensitive to what God wanted me to do. So um, I'm just blessed right now. I'm blessed beyond measure. Um, serve a great, great pastor uh, in Indianapolis. Brother Terry Long is my pastor. Uh, phenomenal man of God, my covering. Couldn't do, no, couldn't, couldn't do none of this without him. And um, I'm just excited about what God's going to do for us. Okay, so are, you're evangelizing, right? Yes, sir, full so time. How long have you evangelized? Been evangelizing since about the year 2001. Um, started out in eastern Kentucky. Um, I had a lot of, lot of doubt. Um, I knew God had a calling for us. But as in you're dealing with your flesh, it's hard to accept no. So, for example, if I'm going to call your pastor and say, hey, God called me to evangelize, uh, I'm ready to go. He said, well, let me get back at you. So we live in a generation where we have to, we want the answer now. Yeah. Tell me now, no, tell me either yes or no, I won't. I'm not going to go to I receive an answer. So uh, I had to deal with that. It, it was really tough to deal with because I knew God had a calling. I just didn't know what it was. Um, and I, I, I learned to be patient, wait on the Lord. Um, the Bible says a man gift to make room for him. Yeah. So I knew if God, if, if you're in this, you're going to make a way. I've just got to be sensitive enough, humble, and recognize that ministry is more than just behind a platform. Yeah. Um, I've got to do other, there's jailhouse ministry. Doing things that most folks don't want to do is pretty difficult. So um, it's not all about the shout. It's not all about the praises, but it's about the kingdom. It's about souls. So once you have that kind of mentality, um, you'll see God start opening doors. And it, it, it was, it's just been great, it's been great. So um, do you typically just travel on the weekends? Because I know that your wife is an RN. Yeah, she, she's a phlebotomist. She, um, she, uh, phlebotomist. Yes, yeah, so she's a phlebotomist. So she, uh, she practices on the whole house. Uh, she uh, Actually, my daughter, my youngest daughter, she is a, she's following my wife's footsteps. Good. And she practices on the whole house as well. So, um, but we travel um, practically every weekend. We're, we're gone. Okay. Um, now uh, we're seeing more than ever. We're seeing churches that have want to extend revival. So uh, we're, we're taking on um, my mentality was God, whatever door you open, um, I'm willing to walk through the door. Yeah. Um, sometimes we got to learn to sacrifice. Um, you're talking about preaching three services one day. It, it's rough, but God will always give you that rest when you need it because yeah. once you're kingdom minded, God, God will take care of the rest. So. We travel full time. We've been to Alaska. Um, we've curved into 2023. We're headed to um, preach for some great guys. Um, Doug White in um, Texas. Uh, we're, we're just excited about what God's doing. And whatever door God opens, we're willing to walk through that door. Absolutely. Um, are you finding, like, in your travels, because we're blessed in the sense that we're here. And some of us are connected with ministries outside yes, um, of the state of Ohio and whatnot. But I remember when I was younger, and maybe when some of us were younger, that it was nothing to have a revival in the sense of um, 
a week, like Sunday through Sunday revival, um, every night or five nights or a Friday, Saturday, Sunday, or a Wednesday through Sunday. So in your travels, are you, are you finding that there's still a lot of churches that are having those types of revivals or is it more like a Sunday hit it hard? What are you seeing? Right. Well, you, you're starting to get back to those um, revival. A lot of guys that I'm preaching for, for example, Brother Cook, Philip Cook in uh, Madisonville, Kentucky, he was raised apostolic back in Mississippi. He, just like yourself, he said, we would have revivals for weeks upon weeks and upon weeks, and we've sort of strayed away from that. But he told me last year, so the Lord has dealt with him about getting back to that. So we started a revival with him on a Sunday, Pentecost Sunday, and we went hard, but we didn't have a night service. He said, because I want to try going Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday to see how, how the congregation yeah. respond because we have to be sensitive to the congregation. Um, and Monday's service was just as powerful as Sunday's service. Tuesday's service was crowded and as powerful as Sunday and Monday service. And Wednesday was the ice on the cake. So you're starting to sense a lot of churches that are starting to get back to, we need more church. We, need, yeah. we know that we're occupied. We know that we got jobs. We got school, but we got to have church. We got, we got to have, we, we need this. And churches are starting to come back. As a matter of fact, I'm preaching for uh, an elder church in Newcastle, great guys. As a matter of fact, my first opportunity preaching outside of Kentucky was in Indiana. So we're preaching on a Saturday, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Could possibly be longer uh, wow. because there's, there's a need for more church. Yeah. And, and I'm just excited. You, you see that, but... In the same token, you do see a lot of churches where um, we will have a Friday, not a Saturday, but we'll do a Sunday. So it's just, it's just a balance of, of both. Okay. Um, another question would be that in your travels, um, there's probably some, or maybe not your travels, but in your ministry, there's probably been some times that you've had challenges. Yes. So what, what are a couple things that have helped you through some of your most challenging times as it pertains to your ministry? I tell you, uh, probably one of the toughest, toughest challenges when I first got in ministry was, was doubt. I had a lot of doubt placed upon my shoulders. You know, and, and once that, once you don't have that, once you don't have that backing or that confidence, in, uh, if others don't have confidence in you, it's easy for you to not have confidence in yourself. Yeah. Um, you could just think as ministry, just going through the motions, but... I didn't really have that backing that, that I thought I needed, and it was difficult. I, I would preach, but it was still difficult. I feel as though there was no, no anointing there. I was reaching. I was wanting something that I didn't have. Yeah. And I, I was praying, God, I, what, is it, what is it that I'm missing? I need something. I need a, I need a lift. I need a boost. And um, we left Kentucky. We moved to Indiana. I'm still trying to find. And even though I evangelized, it was still, I, it was still difficult, you know, but um, I remember sitting down with my pastor now, and um, we, I, we met and we joked. And uh, once I, we introduced ourselves, and I was preached for him once, and we started going there, I, I felt as though God had put me in the right place to where not just for me, because as an evangelist, you just don't want to leave your kids with anybody, you know. Yeah. Um, so I felt as though my kids would be fed, they would be safe, um, and it really sort of, sort of blind shit of that doubt that I had. I, I was able to, to, to be in a position where God could not use, use me, but he could also use my wife and not just her, but my, kid, but my kids as well. So I had to deal with that, you know, uh, and it, it was difficult growing up, um, you know, not having that extra support system behind you. Um, but I thank God now that you know, I can look back on my experiences from the past and it helps me. You know, I, I, I've learned to be humble. Because as a young evangelist, it's hard to become humble because it, you, you think it's about the bright lights. And, and God will, in a, in a roundabout way, he has a way of humbling us to get us to realize this is not about you. You know, I'll, I'll shut every door. I'll, I'll pull the blanket from you. Whatever I have to do to get you to slow down to realize, take a deep breath. Everything's going to be okay. So I've learned from those difficult, those challenges. And I think that's what has really helped me today as far as dealing with dealing with racism dealing with um, um, you know I, I, I remember a preacher in Bible one time and a man come up to him after service and he's crying he's got on bib overalls and uh, 
big combat boots, you know, and he come in and he just, he said, I'm going to be honest with you. He said, when you walked through the door and I seen this black man come in and you're going to preach to me. And he said, I thought, this is, this is crazy. He said, but man, when you start preaching with love. Yeah. He said, I look beyond the color. He said, because I realize God, God isn't concerned about color. And he said, I just want to apologize. One of my greatest supporters, that guy, he, he owned a, uh, a hotel chain, and he told me, if you're ever passing by, you got a place to stay. So um, God was, has a, been able to put us in situations where we have changed people, and it's wow. not us. It's about the God that's in us. Yeah. And, people will, the, and the only God that most people will see is the God that dwells in you. So I, I thank God for that, I, that I've learned from those challenges. And now I'm able to speak on those things because it's not something that I, that I have not experienced. It's something I had to go through. Yeah. And I've experienced that, uh, that, it, that it's real. And, and, it can, and it can be detrimental to you, your family, and your ministry. But thank God he gives us that peace. I guess we all go through some of those times, don't we? And I, I'm always encouraged when I hear that. If you stay in it. You don't eject. Because when you eject prematurely, God's the kind of God that says you have to pass the test. Yeah. That's the difficult if you don't, part is we, want to, we don't want to go through that. You know, we don't want to deal with it. But we have to understand God will put you in situations, and we're, we're so eager to say, God, get me out. I want to get out. I want to deal with this. But in the long run, God is keeping you there for, for, for a lesson, you know. If yeah. you sit here, you ride out the storm, there's a lesson in the storm. I know we're going to go to the other side, but realize something. There's a lesson that can be learned. So I learned. And it, like I said, it just wasn't for me. It's also for others as well. You know, so God, God's been good. He, he's, he's been good. I, I thank him for those situations because I approach every situation different, but I also approach it with the understanding that God's got me in this situation for a reason. Don't know what the outcome's going to be. Right. But I do realize that all things work together for the good. To them that love God and call according, it's going to work out for the good. So everything's going to be all right. That's good. So on the flip side is um, some things that you've learned going through the valley in a sense. So, you know, you've been in ministry for several years. Um, you've traveled a lot, been a lot of places, seen a lot of unique things. What are some of the great rewards that you've experienced throughout your ministry? I tell you, some, some of the greatest, you know, I, I, um, I, I'm a revivalist. I, I love seeing people excited, enthused. But more importantly, I love seeing people baptized and filled with the Holy Ghost, serving the Lord. Uh, some of the rewards is when you get to go back to those churches. And, and you, we, you know, we were preaching revival here um, several years in, in, in um, uh, Florida. And there was a young lady, she was worshiping and um, the Lord had brought her, her husband into church and he got the Holy Ghost, got baptized and so forth. And every time we go back, he runs up this smile on his face, man. And he's just, you know, it, th those things like that makes ministry reward. Um, to me, it's not about the money. It's not about the bright lights. I don't care if nobody knows my name. But just to see people come from out of darkness into the marvelous life and to let God change them, man, it, it's it's rewarding. You know, I, I would take that more than anything else. So, uh, some of the greatest highlights of my ministry, though, I would have to say, was my kids. Uh, my son was five years old. He received the Holy Ghost, uh, baptized in Jesus' name. Um, my youngest daughter, I wasn't there when she was baptized, uh, but she received the Holy Ghost. But one of the highlights of all that would have to be my oldest daughter, who has a little autism and that's when doubt stepped in because doubt says, you know, God, you know, she doesn't need the Holy Ghost. You know, you're an evangelist, you know, she's going to be okay, and da, 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 and so forth. But I remember playing drums one day, and I re I'm a retired drummer. I remember playing drums, and my daughter <laughs> was sitting on the second row, and um, she just threw her hands in the air. And I watched the Holy Ghost just move on her, and she began to speak in tongues. Now, from that day, that erased any doubt in my mind. It don't matter who it is, God can fill you with the Holy Ghost. That, from that point on, I, I've, I've learned, listen, I will pray trees to the Holy Ghost. Yeah. <laughs> I don't care. If you're in the building, I don't care. It's going to get the Holy Ghost. 
But just to see God do that to her, fill her with the Holy Ghost, man, it just, it just brought my faith. So, um, and just to see people change, that, that, I, to see people, to, and to people, for people to give you their testimony, you don't know what I've been through to get to this point now. And to see them still serving God, that makes ministry. I mean, it makes you, you, you can't put a price tag on a soul. And that makes ministry. Traveling, that makes it all worth the while. So I think one thing that we can learn from that, don't put too much into the things of this world. Yes. Because it's going to rust. It's going to break down. That's investing in people and watching the Holy Ghost. What is this kind of little off? So what's one thing that you love about your life right now? Right now. It has to be. I love, I love serving the Lord with this beautiful lady here. I tell you, it don't get no better than that. Um, to serve the Lord as a family, I mean, it, it's, it's phenomenal. I, I wouldn't trade it, wouldn't change it, the course that God has taken us. Um, you know, I've been to places, um, I preached for one of my great friends in, in um, Alabama, and we had a phenomenal service. And so during the service, he said, listen, are you available to come back next week? I said, well, I'm preaching for my pastor. He said, we're going to change that. I want you guys to come back. So to make a long story short, we were able to come back. So me and him sit down talking a couple weeks later. He said, man, I'm going to tell you why you came back. He said, I loved your preaching, but it wasn't your preaching. I said, well, okay, thank you. He said, the reason that we brought you back is because my wife looked at me and said, would you look at his wife? And my wife was praying people through the Holy Ghost. That's right. And I remember years ago, and see, my wife, she was shy. We'd come in. She, I'd preach. She'd sit down. And I'd be honest with you, I thought that's what it was. You know, you take care of the kids. Everything's fine. So we were preaching uh, for a church in Illinois, a great friend of ours. And his wife prophesied to my wife and said, the Lord told me to tell you that this ministry is not for the Harpers by itself, but you are his helpmate. Yeah. And, uh. Man, from that point on, she's been, you know, there's been times I'm trying to find her. Where's she at? Where's she, you know? And I just scan the crowd and see where everybody's over and over. And I can see this little lady, and there she is. There's, there she's at. But I thank God that he brought us together, and, and we just, we just want to be a, be a mouthpiece in the kingdom and uh, do all we can do to see people saved. That's, that's, that's makes my ministry right now, I, I really enjoy it uh, because we never question where we're going we never question gas prices. We just go. We just go. Because the blessing to me is when somebody calls and says, hey, Brother Harper, are you available to come in September? Yes, sir. We're, let, let's go. So That's awesome. That's the blessing because I'm expecting God to do some great things. So. In, your, in your travels, um, as, as far as recently, not years ago, but right now, what are some, some things that you're seeing in um, in churches that you're going to what maybe a common denominator whether it's challenges i think that so some of the friends that i have um when i get overwhelmed and sometimes stress or frustration or whatever whatever we're dealing with um church home uh, whatever the minish, the mission um i'm finding that i'm not the only one dealing with some of those things so as an evangelist Right. And the calling of an evangelist, what are some, not just the challenging things, but what are some of the things that you're seeing in a lot of the churches that you're going to? Well, uh, you know, like, you know, there's so much that's pulling at the church. There's so much that's pulling at, at, at homes and, and families and the lack thereof. Uh, I'm starting to the sense, that, you know, like you just said, the stress level, uh, just the mundane of life, uh, so much being pumped at us and pushed at us and then not to mention COVID and being shut in and isolated that really didn't help the situation that actually worsened it uh, you see a lot of fear uh, uh, and I think it's the fear of the unknown because the Lord's coming back I mean it's it's just any given day it could be right now and the Lord's coming back so I think it, it's the fear uh, because we don't know the fear of the unknown and you can sense that in a lot of churches you can sense the the uh, sort of the isolation so that the, some folks are living in the cocoon. We're so, we're so afraid wow. to really get out. 
I sense that a lot. You know, you, you can preach a good sermon and some are shout, some are dance, and all that's fine in it, in it, you know, whatever God's doing. But you can sense the, just the heaviness on people. Uh, there's a spirit of heaviness that's just uh, just running rampant. Mm -hmm. uh, and, it, and you could sense it. And, and uh, uh, not just on our adults, but our kids as well. You know, our, our young folks are dealing with a lot of stuff that uh, it just blows my mind. You know, uh, and, but you see now, you see more, more churches are coming up with a, a solution to the problem because it's more than just our, us parents, it's our, our kids too. So you're starting to see a lot of churches, okay, we need to do something. We need to come up with a Christian school overnight because our kids have been having to deal with this, come home and tell mom about this. And now mom and dad has to deal with this along with the kids and trying to explain it. You mm -hmm. know, we didn't evolve from monkeys and all this other stuff. Yeah. So the stress level and just the, it, it's just so much, so much pressure placed on homes to where uh, people really trying to get the mindset to serve God, but at the same time, I think we're so focused on once we leave the church, what we have to deal with. Instead of seeking ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. I think if we just really seek God with an open heart, God will take care of the rest. So you can sense that stress level at, at an all-time high. What are some of the, um, I don't know that every church is a break, breakthrough church. Right. Uh, that's having almost a season of breakthrough. Um, but what are some, I think we want to be a breakthrough church, right? We want to be a church that is spirit-led, right. that we are evangelizing our community. We're loving one another. We're, I think those are some, not afraid right. to just worship. Um, so what are some of the attributes, characteristics of some of the, you've been to some, as an evangelist, you're at all kinds of churches. Right. So t looking at those revival churches, what are some of the characteristics that you've noticed in your guys' travels? Well, uh, most of the church, like I said, some, some churches, you know, they're, they're not just, I don't think they're, God, I think God has to get us ready before we can ever step into that next realm of revival. Uh, it may be times of purging. It may be, it may be seasons of weepings. But uh, one church in particular uh, that, uh, that uh, is Brother Philip Cook in Madisonville, uh, Brother Shane Britt, one of my great friends in, in um, Alabama, uh, they went through seasons, uh, seasons of where they were just weeping and hurting and drying. As a matter of fact, Brother Cook lost his dad uh, just early this year. We were scheduled to preach a revival. Uh, he lost his dad, and he told me, I want you to come. I feel like you need to come. So we went, and it just broke. Wow. He said it went, we went through times of fasting. Fasting is important. Times of corporate prayer. We just got together. We had a mentality. We got to have it. And it, from that day on, it just broke, and they've been in revival. And he started a Christian church, and um, he said we had to because he said, I believe the devil's in the school system. Um, uh, there's so much corruption, and so he said we had to start this. So they start this, they start this Christian school, and, and da da da. So he texted me Wednesday. He said we just baptized ten of our Christian students, and several got the Holy Ghost. So God, God will put them in that realm of revival with the momentum. It just, it just keeps going, and it just keeps going. And, and understand something, all that's great, but that is not what revival is. Because some will, will think that because we're not seeing people baptized and people get the Holy Ghost, then we're not in revival. No, that, no that's not what revival is. Revival is when the saints of God, we are re-energized. Because yeah. it does us no good to reach the lost if we're not revived. Right. Because when they come into this building, they want to be helped. They want to be, it does no good for the hurting to come into the hurting. But when we're energized and we're full of faith and we can reach those, I, I, that characteristic of just of, of worship and of just giving God their all, uh, you can sense it, that, that it'll start breaking. It'll, it'll gradually, it'll start breaking. And, and the more the saints of God put into it, the outreach, um, just the, because you never know who's going to walk in this building today. We don't, we don't have a clue. No. Uh, so that's why we as saints of God, we have to set up an atmosphere. So that when they do come in here, there's something here that will change them. They'll feel something they never felt before. 
you know, uh, worship is another char characteristic that you see a lot. Churches that are just giving it their all. You know, we're not waiting for somebody to lead us into worship. We're just going to give it all. Going to give it all. And then you'll start seeing the breakthrough and the change will start falling off and, and, and God will start moving. So those are just some of the characteristics, you know. Um, and then it gets so overwhelming when you got to go into building programs and uh, then, the, then the stress. But realize if God's in it, it's, it's going to work out. It's going to work out. So that, That's so good. Um, I have just a couple of questions. We have a couple of minutes left, about 10 minutes. Um, when we talk, um, there is a common denominator that I always hear come out of your mouth, and you're always referencing your, your covering. Right. So I just I wanted to ask, um, which is your pastor, but who are the people that speak into your your life, you and your wife's lives um, that you value? I mean, can you, can you give me, a, if it's one, if it's a couple people that, that you personally value and the effect that that has on your life? Yes, yes. There, there, there are, you know, there are several guys who that, you know, I, I hold dearly to me. You know, great, your pastor's one, great guy. And I always tell him, hey, man, look, if there's anything that God puts in your heart, for me, then I'm going to receive it. You know, I'm not, I'm not this big giant of an evangelist where if I receive a word from somebody, I'm, no, I'm not. That's, yeah. I'm just as humble as they come. Um, but I had a great friend of mine who, who um, he, we would speak every day. He's speaking to my life every day. Uh, matter of fact, we were going, I was going through a tough time. Um, didn't know why. Matter of fact, I just thought about giving up. And he said, I'm going to pray that God will, fill your schedule and keep you on the road. And I said, there's no way. And I stayed busy. I mean, I just stayed busy. And uh, we were pre And you see, God, God does things that, you know, we don't understand. Great man. I mean, he was, he was my mentor. Uh, he's speaking to me and my wife. Kids, great guy. And so we're preaching for this guy, Shane Britt, brother Shane Britt. Never, I met him one time. And so we're preaching him in Alabama. My wife runs in. She said, we need to pray. I said, what's going on? She said, Brother Brinley just had a massive heart attack. So, and I've got to preach. So there's no way. So I'm thinking, he's had this before. I'm going to get to the hospital. He's going to be okay. You know, this is my mentor. This guy, it's going to be all right, you know. So when I walked into that room, I felt as though that, that he was gone. So a piece of me was gone. I thought that that could never be replaced. I, I didn't want nobody speaking to my life. Uh, I, I really thought about giving up. What am I going to do? But what I did know is God was introducing me to somebody else who was wow. going to step in and take his place. Wow. So now Pastor Shane Britt in Alabama, he speaks into my life. Uh, just, it, just phenomenal. Um, Brother George heard the evangelist out of Indiana. Um, well, now when he speaks into my life. Um, but, I mean, I, I, I would, I would, I, I try not to get teary, teary out it when I talk about my pastor. Um, it's, uh, it's just amazing. Um, when we first start going to the church in Lawrence, and I sat down and he said, we're going to take a couple of weeks off. I just want you to just, to heal and, and and man, he just preached right into my heart. He preached right into me. While I was broken, he was hitting me right there. And uh, when I was ready to go back on the field, he said, I'm going to put you back on. Let's go. Let's get out of here. He said, I don't want you to come home. <laughs> and I'm thinking, why would you say that? I don't want you to come home. I want you to stay out there. He said, don't come home. And uh, I, I, we haven't been home. Um, I mean, we're, we're there on weekdays, um, but we're, we're never there on Sundays. And um, Such a great and part of, part of my life. Um, I don't know where I would be without, without a covering like that. I don't know where you would be without a covering. Because um, at the end of the day, um, we might not always agree, but I can guarantee you one thing. When you stand before God, and God said, well done, a good and faithful servant, you're going to look back and say, thank God for my pastor. And I thank God for, for my pastor. All those men who speak into my life, I, I hold them dearly. Brother Bagwell, Brother Tippy, uh, Brother Knowles in, in Florida, 
phenomenal guys. Wow. And, um, uh, because believe it or not, I'm, I'm a real shy, introvert kind of guy. I know that's hard to believe. Um, <laughs> and my wife will tell you I don't like roller coasters. Um, if we're going to go to the mall, I'm going to sag in the back. If we're going to go to a, any kind of function, I'm going to sit in the back. I don't know. I just... I, <laughs> And somebody said, how can you evangelize? I've been evangelist and preach like you preach to me. So listen, I'm just a big teddy bear. Uh, <laughs> but, I, but I love the Lord, and I thank God for, for uh, my mentors. Amen. So two things, and then we're going to close. Um, number one is I just wanted to make this statement, is that if I've learned anything in ministry, number one, the fivefold ministry, I've always believed that should be Represent, represented even in the local body. Yes, yes. Um, we've got to develop those ministries that are helping us, whether administratively or those that are just outgoing. Not all of us are totally outgoing, right? Um, some of us are more inward, introverted. Right. But there's such a value on all of the things that take, take place. And when I've seen... Um, what I would call successful ministries, um, not talking about monetary value. I'm talking about people that are effective in the kingdom of God. That's, why, well, that's what I mean by um, successful. People that are effective in the kingdom of God. They're effective in their own Christianity. They're effective in sharing their Christianity. They're effective. One of the things that I found is that it's never been um, just a one-man show. Right. That that the wife, the spouse that God has given is just as a much of that anointing. Right. And um, I know that our young people are not in here. I'm going to say it, hoping that they're going to see this. But they need to be very careful on the spouse that they're looking at. Because right. when you make those vows, you don't make those vows to anybody else on this planet. Not your job, not your banker, nobody we're doing a baby dedication today. You're going to hear that same thing today. Um, but that help mate, help meet that God gives us is that we do ministry together. And um, if the enemy can destroy a marriage, right. he's right. taking 50% of the possibility away, right? So, so the last question is this. Uh, and it's one of those sit on the edge of your seat. If there was a way, hypothetically, that the, ga the camera would zoom in and you could broadcast to every marriage, every man, woman, boy, girl, um, speaking, even prophesying to the unborn, of course, you've got to cut out all the fluff. You know, what, what are a few things that every guest that walks in this building today, every weakened Christian, every frustrated Christian, every person that feels that stress that you're talking about, every person that wants the next level. I'm throwing a lot at you. No, but what would, what would be your message? What would you say to the Christian world or the lost world about the message that you preach all the time? What would you say? I would probably say, first of all, that uh, no matter what we're facing, no matter what we're going through, uh, in the good times and the bad times, uh, in the mountaintops, even in the valleys, we first got to understand that God knows exactly where you are. Yeah. You're never too far gone or far off where God can't reach you. I would tell them the first and most important thing is to put God first. Above all else, a, a house, a home is not complete unless, unless God is the center of the home. I've learned that by experience. When mom and dad will serve God, the kids will serve God. The kids are going to be a reflection of not what they see at church, mom and dad. Not what the pastor preaches. The kids are going to be a reflection of what they see you do at home. So if there's less God at home, right. Good. then the less chance of your kids serving God is going to be that much less. So I would say put God first in everything we do. 
Serve God with all of your heart, all of your soul, and all of your might. Because soon and very soon we're going to see the king. And I want to make sure that when I stand before God, as for me and my house, the writer said, we're going to serve God. So I'm going to make a conscious decision that whether it's just my last day today, that I'm going to live my life today as if it was the last day on earth. Amen. Let's all stand. We're going to have Brother Harper. He's going to actually pray over us um, in closing. And I hope, I hope this has been, um, I hope you see the benefit of this. Jesus empowered those that were closest to him with a conversation. Jesus' yes. teaching didn't, he didn't pull out a scroll and start going through his points. It just started flowing out of him. So it's the power of a conversation. Um, but would you just close us in prayer and pray over us in the process? God, we love you this morning. Thank we you. thank you, God, for this opportunity to, to impart in such a great group of people on this side of heaven. I pray, God, that you would touch every mom, touch every dad this morning, God, every grandparent this morning, every teacher, Lord, those who are watching on webcasts. I pray, God, that you would move upon them this day, Lord. Help us to get the understanding, God, that you're coming back soon. And above all else, God, we must be saved. I pray, God, that you would touch us, God. Keep us, God, in the palm of your hands. Order our footsteps this day, Jesus. And God, we promise to give you all the praise and all the glory. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Amen and amen. Amen. God bless you. Thank you for being here. In about 10 minutes, we're going to gather around the front. We're going to open in prayer. God bless you.